Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got my friend Nick Charney, one of the co-founders of Apex Ammunition on the line. Nick, how you doing? Doing good, Jay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited. Um, I just got in the mail some TSS, some Apex Ammunition uh, TSS uh, Tungsten Super Shot, uh, both in a 20 gauge and in a 12. Uh, I've got two boxes right here in front of me. I've got the GT20 a uh, three-inch, uh, one and five-eight ounce uh, nine shot at you know it's shooting 1,175 feet per second, and then the GT3, which is the three-inch, two and a quarter ounce nine shot, shooting nine or excuse me, 1,190 feet per second. And I can't wait to uh, go turkey hunting with these here next month. We can't wait to hear about your success on it. It sounds like it's going to be a jam up time in Mexico. Yeah, for sure. So, Nick, um, basically for the listeners out there, I want to introduce you and Apex Ammunition and talk about you and your other co-founders of this company. Um, so I'll let you take the floor and kind of talk about, uh, you know, you getting together with this um, idea and the dream and, and you know, got how you guys formulated Apex Ammunition. Sure, uh, that'd be great. Um, so we started in about 2016, uh, kind of stumbled onto some of the, the shots um, was hearing through kind of the only way to get it was kind of like this underground black market. And so um, kind of got some of the shot, um, experimented with it. At first, we were kind of a little thrown ourselves based on shooting such small sizes, you know, seven and a half, eight, nines, and even nine and a half. Um, traditionally, I, I used some other, you know, competitors' loads beforehand, uh, typically heavier than lead alternatives. Um, and so when we got, kind of got our hands on this, uh, I went out one day and I loaded some up in my 10-gauge and went, went to pattern it, and it was just absolutely unreal. Uh, you know, being a, a military officer by trade is my, my primary job uh, at the time. You know, I, I really didn't have too much time to load this up, so I called one of uh, a friend of mine over um, and showed him kind of a pattern, and I said, you know, man, nobody's, nobody's loading this stuff. And I said, I'd really like to be able to, you know, just buy it. Um, but I said, I think there's some opportunities here to do it with waterfowl shells as well. So he actually, in turn, Jared, uh, Jared Lewis, one of my partners, um, is another co-founder. Uh, he invited uh, another friend of his, and which is our, now our third partner, uh, Jason. And we put together a duck hunt that winter in Oklahoma, and I loaded up some uh, TSS and steel duplexes, which is essentially just stacking steel on top of TSS, and uh, for a traditional ounce and a quarter waterfowl load. And we were out there hunting, grabbing a few uh, easy one, two birds as soon as sh uh, limit shooting light broke. And uh, afterwards, you know, they kind of started uh, fading. So there was one Drake Mallard that come in, and, and it was kind of good 35, 40 yards and just was able to lean up, shoot it, and it was it was dead on impact. And so we all kind of looked at each other and was like, man, we're, we're really on to something here. Um, you know, that night, just over a couple beers, we were talking about how nobody was loading this stuff. It's not commercially available. We've seen firsthand how awesome it is. And I think there's an opportunity for us to, to really create a, a, a revolutionary product here. And so uh, between that time in December ish, January of 16, 17, uh, by February, we filed for our federal firearms license. And by April of that year, we were, we were really starting out and uh, making sales that year within four months of. Uh, of the idea we were born and we were selling turkey shells, which is, you know, where I've always traditionally cut my teeth uh, personally. And from there, we, we developed up everything and, and got all the licenses and, and just went ahead and started loading and selling. And it was kind of funny. The, the first launch that we had, we, we built up as much as we could, got everything in time for season. And, and when the time it hit the website, we were, we were sold out of our entire allocation in, in just 16 minutes. And so I think that was kind of the, the cornerstone of, I think we really are onto something truly revolutionary. And so from there, we just ended up scaling it, buying more, selling more, buying more, selling more, and, um, you know, educating customers along the way about just, in reality, in short, what it is, is the most lethal, non-toxic, U.S. Fish and Wildlife approved uh, shot material out there. So, I mean, this is just one of those uh, American stories of guys having an idea and starting small, and just put, you know, putting their idea to the test, realizing that, yes, this is as good as we think, and then simply just trying to manufacture it and sell the product. From everything I've always heard about this product, it sells itself. As soon as anyone shoots it, if they shoot an animal with it, they realize uh, how lethal it can be. 
uh, from that perspective, feedback that you guys get from customers, what are you hearing out there? That it's just completely revolutionized the shot shell industry, that you're, you can take uh, bigger payloads for, for guys or gals that want to hunt with their traditional gauges, such as 12, um, but we've really been able to revolutionize the sub-gauge line in your 20s, your 28s, and your 410s, where we can go down to shot sizes and nine and a half, nines, and, and pack a good payload in there and not cripple your sub-gauges like they once were using bigger pellets like five lead, four lead. Um, and so it's just been honestly humbling to see so many customers, especially whether they're elderly, disabled, or even children, uh, not be capped by a 25-yard 410 gun in a blind where they can now have that extra 10 or 15 yards wiggle room. And it's just really been kind of humbling and satisfying to be able to interact with our customers on that. The, the, I don't want to say craze, but it's literally a craze in turkey hunting right now, and you're seeing guys, you know, wanting to do super slams with 410s and, you know, 20 gauges and, you know, literally carrying a lighter gun than a 12 gauge, and there's so many benefits to carrying it where before, uh, when they didn't have the right shot, it was hard to kill a turkey with a 410. It was hard to kill one with the, with the uh, a 20 gauge, uh, but you're seeing guys all over the internet. You've seen it on, on Facebook. You're seeing it on Instagram, where people are giving testimonies where their literal 410 uh, is patterning better at 40 yards, and then their old 12 gauge that they've shot for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years turkey hunting. Um, it, it's pretty neat to see how something revolutionary like this. Uh, TSS can basically take an industry and let's call it Nick, you know, turkey hunters, a lot of them are pretty old school guys and pretty set in their ways and they have certain ways they like to do things. Um, but from my perspective, it's almost like TSS has just allowed them to open into a whole new arena and, and you know, shoot birds out there at 40 yards even further with smaller uh, gauge shotguns. Just unreal. It, it absolutely is, and, and you know, we, we certainly don't promote shooting um, unrealistic or excessive distances, but the, the way I translate it to, to people is simply that um, sometimes out there you get a bird that's very in the open. You know, you think about out west where you're in Nebraska, Montana, uh, Colorado or something, and it, it might be a, more, a bit more open terrain. Um, not only are you taking in a, um, you know, a, a two-pound lighter gun, which makes a lot of difference on those excessive mile walks, but... Um, what we tell people is, you know, sometimes, and we've personally been there, right, where you, you swear up and down, you don't have a range finder on you in the heat of the moment, there's a bird out there, you, you, you can't move, and, and you swear he's 40 yards or 45 yards, and you just kind of get that tunnel vision, myopic look, and next thing you know, it, it ended up being 40 or 50, 55 yards, and you, you were covered. We covered you for the extra 5, 10, or 15 yards that you thought it was um, originally but you, you don't lose any performance. You're still saturating the pattern. You're still providing excessive knockdown power. I mean, for example, our, our number nine PSS will actually penetrate ballistics gel the same distance as a number four lead wheel at 40, and we've actually tested it out to 50, um, which it actually penetrated over six inches of ballistics gel with just a number nine shot. So that's what's such great about it is just being able to capitalize on density, material hardness, and not sacrificing performance and still being able to create killable patterns at, at further distances. Yeah, for sure. And, and talk about some of those gel tests that you guys have done and some of the extensive testing that you've actually done to, and, and again, I, I agree that out there, if, if there is any um, people that are, you know, let's call it, you know, down on it or saying, oh, you know, that just promotes long shots, really what you're trying to do is promote more of a lethal shot in that in that 40 yard range 30 yard range you know in the ranges that we're already shooting but what has happened with it is it has been that situation where yeah if you had to take that 50 yard shot now you can actually put more pellets uh, with more penetrating power in the kill zone at that distance absolutely um, you know first and foremost we never set out to design or ever build the longest shooting turkey shell ever. That was never our, our intent was pure and simple, build the most efficient, effective turkey shell ever made. And we've, we've always stuck by that. And so the first and foremost thing we do when we shoot a, a load or we develop a shell is 
does it, can it retain its pattern? Can it retain its pattern efficiency? Usually what we target is anywhere at a minimum of 88% of your entire payload in a 20-inch circle at 40 yards up to about 94 to 95%. So we really try to target that range with every shell we make um, or develop, and we try to run it through as many cho choke and gun combinations as we possibly can. All your major manufacturers in a, in a varying degree of exit diameters and a choke, um, we try to run it through automatics, over under, single shots, pumps, um, you name it, just to make sure that if a customer picks up a shell in Colorado, it's not shooting different for a customer in Maryland or Virginia using the same gun or even two different guns and two different chokes. So we try to do as extensive amount of testing with that as we can. And then we make sure that everything, of course, when we design the speed, that it can at a minimum penetrate six inches of ballistics gel at 50 just because we need to make sure that the energy is there. Um, and then, of course, we'll uh, typically shoot uh, some unconventional items just to kind of gauge their performance. So, for example, we've shot into with our larger shot sizes that we do for a predator load, such as like our twos, fours, and BBs, and those are in bird shot sizes, not not buckshot. Um, we actually go out and shoot unconventional things just to kind of see like phone books. I know it sounds kind of comical, but we like to see what page we can get in the yellow books. Um, and but it, and it just helps us compare against other other mediums, if you will, of what type of uh, penetration we can get because the last thing we ever want to do is develop something that's not efficient and also uh, causes unnecessary harm or undue uh, damage to animals that get away because that's just not ethically what we've ever been about or nor any, anyone should be about. And let's get back to one thing that I don't think I've touched on enough is the, the whole basis of this is the tungsten itself. Talk about tungsten and what it is about tungsten that allows the performance that you've seen in all the different shot loads and combinations that you guys have created. For sure. So first and foremost, not all tungsten is created equal. And what I mean by that is in an alloy, there's different varying amounts or percentages of tungsten and, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service approved alloys, and not all of it is created the same. So what we specialize in, um, is tungsten supershot. So tungsten is an elemental metal that is the one of the highest density metals known to man. And so it comes in in a, actually about a white powder form at about 19.2 grams per cubic centimeter. That's its registered density. And what we do is mix about 96% tungsten with 2% nickel and 2% iron to for essentially center a pellet out of it. And then it gets grounded down and smoothed out and polished so that it's ball bearing tolerance. And then from there, uh, we use, so our, our actual density comes out to 18.1 grams per cubic centimeter. It's 45% more dense than lead. Um, it's 40% more dense than any other um, competitor non-toxic heavier than lead option that's out there. And it's also about double the density of bismuth and about two and a half times the density of steel. So uh, density is really the key here that I hound in on, and I, I use those other topics for reference because they're the most commonly used uh, materials and alloys for, for shot shell pellets. And so when we use such a high-density pellet or a high, high amount of tungsten, we can really shrink that shot size down to 7 8 9s, 9 and even in some cases we've experimented with 10s where you retain a material that does not deform under setback. So what that means is when you actually fire the, the cartridge, um, all that force exerted on the pellets doesn't deform like, it, say, lead would, even under nickel-plated lead, and you're able to maintain that perfect sphere, and you're able to also balance that in order to make sure that you don't lose any kinetic energy or momentum going down range. And that smaller pellet also has less surface area so that when you have less surface area, you get less drag. So it's able to maintain higher speeds down range than a bigger pellet would, resulting in super uh, dense patterns and then also resulting in super efficient patterns that can penetrate anything needed to harvest turkeys, predator. In some cases, we've done deer for for guys in the south that like to run dogs with deer. I know it's very uh, a very um, uh, local, localized you know, sure. term of hunting, but um, things like that. And then, of course, also for waterfowl, we're able to saturate the pattern with some of our loads, either in an extra 90 or 180 pellets in a waterfowl load to really just saturate that pattern and in order to just make sure that your game is dead on impact. Would you say that there is there any one segment that has taken off more, you know, one more than the other as far as waterfowl, turkey, predator, um, 
you know, is there one that is, is, is taken off more than the other or have each one in their own respect, you know, basically revolutionized um, the, their own specific category? The, the turkey has by far. That's really where, like I said, personally I cut my teeth. But with a turkey hunter, they're, you know, some, they're getting into a lot of traveling, but they're going to go out, shoot, shoot a couple birds a year or attempt to. Um, and they really like knowing their pattern. They like having the most dense number counted pellets in a 20 inch circle at 40 yards they can possibly get and that one is absolutely just completely taken off for us to the point where it's really hard to keep up production demands even in the off season and then waterfowlers are really starting to come around um, on the the blended side with the TSS steel blend uh, just for the simple fact is they're they're able to shoot less and not go through as many shells and so they're efficiently shooting more birds they don't have to quote unquote pull it to the plug every time um, you know, just to make sure that they get enough BBs on target, which I think is, is really important. So that's where I think we really lean forward is you just don't have to shoot um, as many shells, and you can shoot less but kill more. And then on the upland side, we've really kind of started seeing an uptick as well where um, people go into hunt on public land where non-toxic is a must nowadays in, in many estates such as California and then a lot of public lands in Iowa, uh, things like that, where they want to go out and they don't want to sacrifice with a uh, less than lead um, density material. And so we've really kind of just started seeing an uptick on those as well because if a, if a guy can only shoot two or three roosters, he wants to make sure that, you know, he may only get one or two or even three opportunities. He wants to make, sh make every shot count. When you talk about, I believe you were saying U.S. Fish and Wildlife approved, correct me if I'm wrong, but, and, and, you know, you're talking about the different materials that in some states are allowed and not allowed with the non-toxic and, you know, I see the different states not going backwards. There are probably more and more states coming on, on board, which is just going to make tungsten and TSS a more viable option. Would you not agree? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, tungsten-based alloys um, are going to be an increasing demand just because, you're right, no, no states are ever going to go back against the lead. And, and when you look at, uh, you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife approved um, essentially matrix of, of viable options, there are several, but then there's also not as many as one would think. And so you're really kind of limited to your options. And, and tungsten comprises probably 50 or 60 percent of your approved alloys, depending on what type of other uh, heavier metals you center it with. But it's really, they're really not going back. And so I, I would probably guess that within the next eight to ten years, I bet we're going to see a substantial increase to non-toxic only across all avenues, um, whether it be um, upland birds, whether it be public lands, whether it be states. I think we're really going to see a large uptick in, in non-toxic approved only shot. I believe that Europe is transitioning that way as well as I don't believe that lead is allowed to be used in Europe. I could be wrong, but um, we're really starting to see that on a global scale now as well. When you said before all tungsten is not created equal, you mean just that. I mean, you, you, you see other quote-unquote manufacturers saying that they're making this tungsten shot and that and, and, and what have you. Talk about why Apex does it better, if you will. Of course. So when I say not all tungsten is created equal, you'll kind of see some marketing campaigns out there where it almost seems like, People want to slap the word tungsten on a box, and then it means the same. So another competitor, when they slap tungsten on there, it's the same as ours, which is not the case. And so why we, we really pride ourselves is we only use 18.1 gram density uh, tungsten super shot, which is, again, comprised of 96% tungsten, 2% nickel, 2% iron. And then, of course, we hand load all of our shells. So that's what's a little different for us is why we pride ourselves on being better is we get more consistent patterns from shot to shot with consumers because we hand load everything. We do it plus or minus 0.1 grains of powder. We do it plus or minus one pellet in every payload. And so we make sure that all of our components, we hand inspect all of our components. Um, if, a, if a vendor sells us a component that's not up to par, uh, we turn it back. And so we make sure that every box that we, that we dish out, which, by the way, we hand sign every box and on the date that we produce it so we don't just stamp a lot number on there, to let people know this is the date it was built, this is the gentleman who actually built your shells, and you have a peace of mind that it's as consistent as the day before and the day after. You know, it's funny when you were saying that. I just opened, I have a box of GT20, which is the 20-gauge. Um, there's five cartridges in each, in each box, and then 
uh, the GT3, which is a 3-inch 12-gauge, and exactly right inside of the flap, if you will, it says JWS, which is underlined, and then it says 030220, and then JWS 030520 on the 20-gauge box. So I assume JWS is someone's initials, and talk about the benefits of each cartridge being hand-loaded. Absolutely. So uh, that, that gentleman is uh, named Jonathan Stapp. He's, our, uh, he's the lead on our production line. And so when he uh, finds those boxes, he personally loaded those shells. And the, the great thing about it is I believe it adds a sense of touch to a consumer, um, also a level of reassurance that there's still an American worker uh, providing these products to them, and they're not just something that's simply outsourced and, and stamped and uh, mass-produced for to maximize profits. We're we're not a corporation. We'll never be a corporation. We're a, we're an American business, and and we expect that when we're when we're customers ourselves, and so we feel that we can provide that to our consumers as well. And so, with that being said, um, we make sure that when it's hand loaded, everything is up to spec, and that we also randomly bat, uh, batch sample test stuff. So we'll take a few shells out of each lot, and we'll go pattern them and make sure that they're as consistent that's going out the door as a customer would get as well. And when you hand sign it, it, it almost just, it, it just again, it adds that sense of touch to it, but you know that one guy paid his entire attention to loading this cartridge, and, and by hand loading it, we're allowed to use different components that other competitors may not because the way that high-end shot shell machines are loading that might produce 8, 10, or 12,000 rounds an hour, um, there's just certain components you can't utilize in that process because the machine just cannot account for them. It's not a human. It doesn't have a two-eye review by a human. And so you, you're left with a sense of inconsistency or I hope that the machine caught this or I hope that the machine rejected this or I hope that this wad that was dropped in by the machine wasn't defect, which then will cause your pattern either to be inconsistent or the wad to fail. So there's a level of human two-eye review that we can apply that a machine cannot that in order to maintain our consistency. You had talked about chokes before, um, and you talked about you basically have shot every manufacturer, every gauge, every, every you know, combo out there. And you know, without getting specific about brands of chokes and, and all of that, um, have you found that uh, a 12 gauge with the TSS you know, is there a certain distance that, you know, it, a 20 or a 410 actually performs better? Um, is the 12 gauge still, uh, you know, number one, so to speak, as far as if you want the most pellets, uh, you know, because of the bigger size uh, of the gauge, if you want the most pellets in the kill zone, would you say the 12 is st still the way to go? And then with that, also talk about the chokes. I mean, for, a, for turkey hunting, uh, you know, well, forever it's been the tightest um, pattern you can get uh, at, at, at as far out as you can go. But a lot of times if that pattern is way too tight, you're going to miss a bird at, at 25 yards or 30 yards. So talk about all of that, um, all of that right there. Sure. So with the chokes, uh, traditionally the more pellets you put into a load, the more it's going to pattern. Um, just you're going to get more numerical hits on your paper or on your target. Um, and so personally, we, I use a 10-gauge for turkey hunting just because I, I have a, a gun that's very sentimental to me, so I continue to use it because it just means a lot to me. And that's why we also make a 16-gauge turkey shell as well. Uh, we have everything from 10 to 410, but as you shorten the shot column, the shorter you can make it, typically the better patterns you're going to get. So that's why TSS is so so great is you can really shrink that shot column down um, and th the shot string will actually impact almost all at once as compared to a very long shot column. So with different chokes, uh, there are a lot of major brands out there uh, that offer different types. You have par balancing parallel systems, wad stripping designs, and all that relates to is kind of there's a misnomer. You'll hear constriction of choke tube, and what that really means is actually means exit diameter. So on a choke tube, the degree of constriction is what you're taking it from your bore diameter down to the exit diameter of the choke tube. So that's really the true meaning of what constriction means. Really, when you hear guys in the, say in the 12-gauge talk about, well, I'm shooting a 660 or 665, that's actually their exit diameter. Their degree of constriction is bringing it down from whatever their gun manufacturer's bore diameter is down to that exit diameter.
And so um, traditionally our shells, the, they do offer a lot of flexibility and leeway, but traditionally at 20 and 25 yards, you're going to be shooting about a basketball size pattern. That goes with just about any turkey load out there, whether it's lead, TSS, or any other uh, shot material out there. You're going to shoot about a basketball size pattern. Um, and that's typically why we shoot to 40 yards, is traditionally most turkeys are killed between 25 and 40 yards, depending. Uh, of course, not always. There's always outliers. Um, but with those choke tubes, depending on the internal design of that choke tube, uh, it can and the exit diameter, the turkey hunters, they love a really tight choke. And the thing about TSS is you, you don't want to over-constrict it. So if you really get below like a 660 uh, with, our, with our internal design uh, from our shot shells, you really start to blow the pattern out. So you try to over-constrict it. Um, and what happens is you end up getting inconsistent, blotchy patterns. So they're not smooth. They're not even across the board. You get kind of pockets of here and there where the choke tube just tried to constrict it and the material doesn't give. Um, and, you know, this material, while we do use a wad that is designed for this and it prevents uh, pellet-to-barrel contact, um, you don't want to over-constrict it because when you do over-constrict it, you can risk potentially blowing out your choke tube um, over, over time. And so that's why we've seen with a 660 and a 12-gauge or a 555 and up in a 20-gauge, in a that's really where you kind of see. So turkey hunters traditionally shoot a very tight choke tube because they're shooting smaller pellets. They're using stuff beforehand like lead where it's malleable it can actually take the constriction it can deform it to the to the choke um and then from there when um when you look at waterfowlers we'll compare other to waterfowlers they're using traditionally bigger shot sizes um you know twos fours um bb's uh tee shot you really are shooting a more open choke because you have to if you if you over constrict it those pellets can uh incur a phenomenon called bridging where they'll actually lock together and something's got to give. And oftentimes it's not the pellets, it's going to be your choke tube or your end of your barrel because you're just trying to over constrict it to get the tightest pattern. And so what we tell people is, you know, give us a call, we'll walk you through your setups, um, you know, we'll try to outline what you're shooting, what gun you're shooting because different constrictions or end constrictions, exit diameters can be different. A, a Mossberg gun has a very large back bore. And so in a turkey choke, a tight turkey choke to a Mossberg would be like a 675 as compared to your Beretta Benelli's, your Browning's, your uh, Remington's. You can go down to a 660, 665 um, and still get that really super tight pattern because the back bores aren't there and you're not trying to essentially take the shot from a, uh, a larger open area down to a smaller area so hard and so fast that you'll actually get your consistent patterns. It's good stuff. I want to um, hit a little bit on the three co-founders of the company and how closely tied in you guys are to the United States military. Um, you're still active, but talk about that. I love that part of the story. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we have uh, three co-founders, myself, um, I'm actively still serving in the military, so I'm an Air Force officer. I'm a civil engineer by trade. Um, I went to the Air Force Academy, got my degree and commission out of there, and I'm still actively serving. Uh, one of my co-founders, Jared Lewis, he's part of the Mississippi National Guard, the 155. He's an artillery officer. Um, and then one of my other partners, Jason, um, he is, uh, he's a civilian, but his wife is a C-17 pilot, which is kind of funny because Jared's wife is actually a U-28 pilot, and my wife's actually an F-16 pilot. So we all kind of joke that we met because our wives are all pilots. Um, <laughs> That's cool. So it, it, they all kind of brought us together. And so um, we, we um, load up out of the shop out of Columbus, Mississippi. That's our hometown where we got started, where we founded. Um, and we continue to just produce shells out of there every single day, you know, 270 work days a year, you know, 52 weeks a year. So um, we traditionally – just have been doing that ever since and just been scaling. And um, over time, we've just designed new products. We've innovated stuff and made it better from previous stuff. We're always, we're always tinkering to make the next best product possible. Uh, but the one thing that's always tied us together has always been that, that kind of military bond between all of us um, that's really was the founding of our company and kind of seems like from the values and ethics that we've been able to instill from that or gain from that has always just been our, our driving force. When I'm looking at these boxes, I'm um, looking at the GT20 and the G3, GT3, um, you know, I totally get the GT20 and the, G, the GT3. It, shouldn't it be GT12? Tell me how those, um, how those, what those stand for and how you came up with those numbers and names of, the, of each one of these designs. 
Sure. So we kind of uh, just kind of had a different nomenclature uh, based on all of our products. They 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 just kind of de- uh, sig- um, sorry. They kind of outline just what different uh, models are offered, and so uh, the, it's not the GT12 because we traditionally only have two lines in the 20 gauge. We offer a three inch 20 gauge that's an ounce and five eighths, and then we offer a two and three quarter inch uh, ounce and three eighths 20 gauge. But on the 12 gauge side, we have much more variants. So we have um, we have everything from a three and a half inch 12 gauge, which is called our PT. Uh, I'm sorry, a PT three and a half. So we, we just designated that between three and a half and three because they also carry different payloads. So our, our okay. three and a half is actually touts a, um, totes a, a two and a half ounce payload in the three and a half inch. And then our three inch can either um, sport a two and a quarter ounce payload, which you have in the GT3. And we also offer a three inch model that's a two ounce model in the 12 gauge is a three inch and then we also offer a two ounce model in a two and three quarter inch 12 gauge um so we have a lot more variance on our 12 gauge line and the reason we just do that is uh we've never been here for the mass production to tell customers what they have we want to build a wide variety of products because there's so many consumers out there that have different guns whether they're older two and three quarter inch whether they just want to shoot a three inch or there's guys out there that would shoot a three and a half inch only because they don't make a four yet um, and so we, we, we really try to just um, offer as many different variants as possible to our customers uh, because that's just important. We, we're never in the business to tell them what they should have. We want to offer them and tell them just merely what they can have. That's good stuff. Uh, you guys recently partnered with um, one of the um, well-respected turkey uh, custom call companies out there, Woodhaven Custom Calls. and. You guys have created kind of a custom shell for them and their customers, uh, and not just their customers, but for them. Uh, talk a little bit about those Ninja uh, TSS shells with that partnership. Absolutely. So uh, we were um, we partnered up with Woodhaven Custom Calls. They um, talk. You know, we've been friends with Scott Ellis, one of the lead pro staff managers for. Um, Woodhaven for a long time, and he kind of coined this phrase, you know, when you're out there, you know, you want to be a turkey ninja, and so uh, Woodhaven, you know, built a series of line of calls around being a turkey ninja, and so they they came to us and uh, were like, hey, we really would love to expand on this uh, because shells, you know, shot shells are just such a huge part of, you know, being a turkey ninja, you know, ninjas have, you know, their certain gear that they use, um, and they want it to be the most lethal and effective gear, and so um, we kind of sat down and draw what would that envision, and so they really liked the, the payloads and the pattern densities that we've already provided before, so we, we've never really offered eight and a half shot too much. We did it on a limited run the first year, um, but we wanted to offer something very unique and different, so we offered an eight and a half shot uh, because we did get some feedback out there that uh, customers were like, I really like your nines, but I want a little bit more knockdown power, but I don't want to lose the pellet count too much. And so we thought it'd be a great opportunity to reintroduce eight and a half shots. So the the Turkey Ninja line encompasses a twelve gauge, uh, two twelve gauge options, a twenty gauge, a twenty eight gauge option, and actually a four ten option. And so in the twelve gauge, uh, we use our traditional payloads with eight and a half shot. Uh, same goes in twenty and twenty eight. And then in the four ten, we kept it with our nine and a half shot because we're able to get the the world's first ever seven eight ounce turkey load. Uh, but we were able to act, so we were able to keep our nine, uh, nine and a half shot, but up the payload to a seven, eight ounce in the 410 to just make a, a serious, awesome 410 shell. Um, and so that's kind of our Turkey Ninja line, if you will, is eight and a half shot in the larger gauges and then uh, nine and a half, but increase the payload in the 410. That's good stuff. Um, talk about some of the struggles of having such huge success early and basically being sold out in 16 minutes uh, and, and, you know, with the unbelievable demand that you guys have, you know, your product has asked for and and the the market has responded, some of the challenges with that as, as a company with, you know, three founders and trying to navigate through the tough business world out there. Absolutely. You know, uh, just coming from folks that have, um, you know, building a business from literally the ground up. We, we, we didn't have any large investments uh, to, you know, start off huge. And so the, the really the trial and the tribulation has just been continuously building, increasing our production capability, uh, increasing our distribution to be able to meet orders. We were receiving calls for orders that we just couldn't fill due to our backup. And we're getting to a point now where we can take them and meet them and, and really just kind of co-locating all of the components needed at once to make sure that you don't order too much to warehouse too much or you don't 
overstock to not sell and uh, to not sell, and then miss out on getting other components for other shells that might sell more. Um, and so, just kind of finding that logistical balance has really been the the biggest struggle that we've been able to overcome. And I think we're at a really good place now where we're able to to meet a lot of our consumers' demand. Um, but just the logistical nightmare, if you will. Uh, has really been the, the biggest struggle learning uh, as well as getting into the industry and offering something that w we felt from our hearts, not necessarily just how can we find a niche in the industry as compared to, hey, we're really um, you know, uh, involved with this emotionally. Um, we feel that others might be out there and resonate with it, and that's kind of always been our, our approach. And then, like I said, just the, the logistically of now being able to get everything on time, in place, and then just being able now to, to produce it has really been our big struggles. But they've kind of been fun because they've been a great learning environment along the way on how to increase without sacrificing any scrap of performance by any means. What would you say to the, the skeptic out there that says, you know, I don't want to pay a high price for my shells. I just want to stick with my cheap stuff that I've been using for the last 20 years. Absolutely. So, you know, I look at that as how much do you have invested in the hunt and do you really think the price, uh, the price of ammunition is, is the cheapest part of your hunt or the most economical, if you will. I'd, nothing will ever build as cheap just because there's, there's, that's what we'd expect from corporations. But for us, what we would like to focus on is, you know, how much do you have involved in a hunt? If I'm coming down to hunt with somebody and I'm paying X thousands of dollars in airfare, um, the gun that I have, the clothes on my back, um, if I'm in, that's an investment to me. That's not ne necessarily an expense. And so if I'm coming down to hunt goulds with you and I'm, I'm paying all the airfare to get into Mexico, the cost of the hunt, everything that's associated with that, or I'm going anywhere else or even just something different, if I'm going out elk hunting, even if I'm hunting public land in Colorado, um, if I'm driving out there, the gas to get out there, I mean, you start adding up your expenses. And they, when you really look at them, you can see how much they add up. And so what we tell folks is ammunition is really the, the most least expensive part of your hunt. And if you're looking for that extra edge to get you successful, that's why we're here. And so when you look back on it, I, I've really never met a person that had a successful hunt that's ever complained that something a part of that, that their, their emotional attachment to that success and that memory that they capture for life, I've never heard them complain about, you know, it costing too much, or I wish I would not have spent the money to go do that. Sure. That's a great answer. Uh, Nick, one final question. Um, how do people find, how do people get this in their hands? Where can they find it? Where can they buy it? Absolutely. They can visit our website, uh, www.apexmunition.com. Um, if they can't, you know, if they can't infer from that, then go to Google, type in Apex Ammunition or even TSS, and we'll literally be the first hit on the top of the page. They can go right to the website and order. Uh, there may be a couple uh, state shipping regulations, um, such as like California, New York, things like that, that prevent us shipping direct to consumer. But on that tab, when you go to our homepage on the bottom left, there's a store locator tab, and they can go in there and check out all of our retailers across the country. And many of, we have many retailers in those states that cannot ship direct to consumer, and they can order them through those retailers or go pick them up. It's great stuff. And, you know, I want to really say thank you. You guys have stepped up. You want to sponsor the podcast, uh, and, and you're supporting what I'm doing, and I know my listeners uh, are very loyal to the companies that support us. And, you know, I... Um, wanted to be a part of, of the Apex team for a long time, and I'm looking forward to shooting and using the product on these Goulds hunts. And, you know, I've had hunters for uh, the last couple of years have been using it, and I've been just wowed with the response that they've told me about all their other turkey hunts using the product. Uh, and so this partnership for me and having you on the podcast and, um, you know, just this, uh, you know, bootstrap, if you will, company that, you know, three guys get together and make something like this happen and make an unbelievable product uh, that everybody in the turkey world is talking about. Uh, it's, it's just going to be a fun uh, deal for me. So I want to say thank you uh, and uh, thanks for sh coming on and sharing, sharing your, uh, you know, your business uh, with us and, and all the great things you guys have going over there. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. We've always admired you for for years and and you're just your genuine authentic message to the to the outdoor 
I wouldn't call it an industry because I've never been a fan of that word, but our, our outdoor community. And I just, we're just humbled to be a part of it. And thank you so much for having us on here and helping us educate more folks on, on the most lethal non-toxic option that exists. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks. And uh, we'll be chatting at you after turkey season and uh, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you again, Jay.